The Fallout universe is a world of plasma weapons, laser rifles, nuclear-powered cars, nuclear-powered armor, nuclear-powered radios, nuclear-powered wrist-mounted computers. And yet, this same world has black and white televisions, radios as the primary method of news consumption, vacuum tubes in every piece of electronics, computers the size of entire rooms, wrist-mounted computers that can triangulate your position on Earth but that only have 64 kilobytes of RAM? How does that work? Well, these seeming contradictions are explained away with a plot device called the Divergence. The idea goes that our universe and the Fallout's universe were one and the same for the majority of human existence. But there was a point when the Fallout universe's timeline split from our own, creating two parallel but very different universes. So, what caused the divergence, and when did the divergence happen? Well, the tricky bit is that we don't really know. The divergence is brought up in The Fallout Bible, written by Chris Avalone, who, while working at Black Isle Studios, helped develop Fallout 2, the cancelled Van Buren project, which at the time was going to be Fallout 3, and Fallout New Vegas, including the DLC's Dead Money and Old World Blues. In 2002, he released nine parts of what is now called The Fallout Bible, which was basically a world-building document for the Fallout universe. Not all of it is considered canon today, but but much of it is, and much of it is referenced in all of the Fallout games, including the ones made by Obsidian and Bethesda. But in the Fallout Bible, he writes that how and when the Fallout universe's timeline diverged from ours will remain, quote, one of the mysteries of the setting. But he then went on to say that the divergence happened sometime after World War II. Since then, much ink has been spilled by fans who really wanted to narrow down the exact year of the Fallout divergence. This has become tricky because this vague sometime after World War II qualification is not consistently held up throughout the series. World War II ended on September 2nd, 1945. Now, one of the defining things about the Fallout universe is that the transistor wasn't invented until much later in history. This explains why vacuum tubes continued to be used in appliances in 2077. In our universe, the transistor was invented in 1947. In the Fallout universe, the transistor wasn't invented until at least 2023. We learned this while reading Jack Cabot's terminal inside Cabot House. If we navigate to the September 5th, 2023 section, we find an entry where he says, I've been experimenting with some of the new transistors, and it looks possible to make a portable version of the Abramelin field generator. So he describes transistors as new. Perhaps they were invented that very year. It's after the invention of the transistor that we begin to see portable electronics and more advanced technology. For example, the first robot butlers, the Mr. Handys, were brought to market in 2037. This is according to the Handy Design document, published by Chris Taylor, another developer of the Fallout series, back in 2007. And remember that Robert House didn't found Robco until 2042, long after the invention of the transistor we read about in the Cabot Terminal. So it's likely he used transistors in some of his miniature electronics like the Pip-Boy. That said, we still see vacuum tubes in the Pip-Boy, in the Pip-Boy from Fallout 1, and even in the Pip-Boy that we see in the marketing footage for Fallout 76. I suppose we must therefore conclude that the transistors that were invented in 2023 were not as sophisticated or efficient as the ones developed in our universe. So, that seems to answer the question, right? The divergence must have happened on or before 1947. After all, if the transistor was invented in our world in 1947, and the divergence happened after 1947, then we would have found the transistor in the Fallout world in 1947 instead of 2023, when we actually find it. But there are a few complications to this theory. The first is that there are a bunch of historical moments in the Fallout universe that take place long before the invention of the transistor in 1947, and well before the end of World War II. For example, the earliest possible point of divergence could be all the way back in 1562. While exploring Mothership Zeta in its DLC for Fallout 3, we find a cryogenically frozen samurai named 
Toshiro Kago. He doesn't speak English in the game, so we don't know what he says, but the Fallout 3 official strategy guide tells us that he was active during the Azuki Momoyamo period, which was between 1568 and 1603. We can date him before 1562, however, because in the game on his armor, he wears the colors of the Oda clan. We know that the Oda clan was destroyed on June 21st, 1582. He is not the only one. We find a recording on the same ship recounting the abduction of a one Andrew Endicott from Salem, Massachusetts, who was abducted in 1697. Hello. Um, hello. My name is Andrew Endicott. On the night of May 17th, the year of our Lord 1697, I was... I was taken from my home in Salem Village. This poses a problem because if the Zetan aliens abducted him, and as we learned from the DLC, they continued to abduct people throughout all of human history, then we should find Mothership Zeta orbiting Earth now, if the Fallout universe and our own shared the same timeline before World War II. But of course, we don't find Mothership Zeta orbiting Earth in our universe. So the only way this could work is if the divergence happened before 1562, or if the divergence isn't a single point in time. I argue that that must be the case. I think that the evidence we find in the series shows us that the divergence happens slowly and sporadically over centuries. And I have a lot more evidence that I think will back me up on this. The Cabot family themselves are one of them. If we head on over to the Cabot House, we find a plaque outside. From the plaque, we learn that Cabot House was erected in 1711. Again, long before World War II. But there is no Cabot House in our own universe. While reading Lorenzo's handwritten journals, we learned that he did a lot of traveling during 1894. The culmination of his travels is when he claims to have found the ancient city of Ubar in the empty quarter of Arabia. We then learn that only a few years after this, he was admitted to the Parson State Insane Asylum on June 11th, 1897, where he stays until we meet him in Fallout 4. But divergence-breaking moments don't just happen in Fallout 4. They happen in all of the games, including Obsidian's Fallout New Vegas. If we head to Prim and enter the Vicky and Vance Casino, we can talk with the Protectron Prim Slim. He gives us a story about the criminal duo Vicky and Vance. First things first. Any boss you've heard about Vicky and Vance being copycats ain't nothing but ill-tempered slander. Fact is, they begun their crime spree two days before Bonnie and Clyde robbed their first bank. So who was copying who? He says that their crime spree happened two days before that of Bonnie and Clyde. That gives us a fixed date. We know that Bonnie and Clyde first started their crime spree in 1932. So if they were in fact copying Vicky and Vance, Vicky and Vance must also have begun in 1932. We find a lot of presumably divergence-breaking moments when reading about the histories of companies. For example, in Fallout 4, we find the Shamrock Tap House, which claims to have been founded in 1787. The Fallout 4 official strategy guide tells us this, and it even says that Paul Revere was rumored to have eaten here. But there is no Shamrock Tap House in Boston, and certainly no record of Paul Revere having ever eaten here. Then, in Fallout 3, Three, we learn about the newspaper called the Capital Post. And if we examine the newspaper, we see that the Capital Post was founded in 1877. But the local newspaper of the DC area is not called the Capital Post in our universe. Instead, it's called the Washington Post. But the Washington Post was also founded in 1877. This is clearly the same newspaper, and it must therefore be a divergence event. For some reason in the Fallout universe, the founders of this newspaper decided to call it the Capital Post, but they called the same newspaper the Washington Post in ours. We find another one in Fallout New Vegas. If we head to the Sunset Sarsaparilla headquarters, we discover that the company was founded in 1918. This is not only well before World War II, but it's 125 years before John Caleb Bradburton created Nuka-Cola. Another interesting one is the propane company Cholet, or Cholet? Let's go with Cholet. We only see it in Fallout 4, but it is all over the place. And on their logo, we see that the company has been around since 1895. 
This is troubling for many reasons. Yes, propane was first discovered in 1857, but after the discovery, it wasn't understood to be a volatile compound until 1910. The man who discovered its volatile properties, Walter Snelling, didn't begin producing propane until 1911, and he didn't receive a patent for the way he processed and produced it until 1913. It wasn't until the 20s and 30s that propane became a major industry. And yet in the Fallout universe, Cholet has been making it since 1895. Another one is from the Far Harbor DLC. If we go to the Vimpop factory and then explore the tour terminal, in tour notes number one, we learn that the Vimpop Cola Company was founded in 1931, making Vim another cola, like Sunset Sarsaparilla before it, that is much older than Nuka-Cola in the Fallout universe. But of course, Vim doesn't exist in our universe, making a fixed date for the Fallout Divergence much more difficult. Now, all of these examples so far have been before the Divergence, but we find just as many that produce troubles for us after the supposed Divergence. Again, we don't have a fixed date for the Divergence, and that was intentional, but we do have the guideline of after World War II. Well, let's head to the Capital Wasteland. If we go to L'Enfant Plaza, we discover a broken glass pyramid in the middle of the plaza. It's beautiful, and it's clearly reminiscent of the Louvre. However, if we were to go to this very same location in our universe, we wouldn't see a pyramid here. Well, that's fine. Maybe they built one in the Fallout universe, but not in ours. The problem is they did build one in ours. L'Enfant Plaza was the beneficiary of one of the first urban renewal projects that took place after World War II, and the first to take place in Washington, D.C. As people came back from World War II and the population began to boom, LaFont Plaza began to develop. It went through redevelopment again in the 1990s to update it. And at that time, they built a glass pyramid in the center of L'Enfant Plaza. The pyramid acted as a decoration and a skylight over a shopping center called La Promenade. And yes, it was modeled after the one we see in front of the Louvre. However, developers decided much later that the pyramid just took up too much valuable real estate. And so they demolished it and removed it in 2013 five years after the release of Fallout 3. <laughs> so, even though we don't see this pyramid in our own world, it was there during the development of this game. And that's why we find it here. And here it will remain forever, for us to visit anytime we wish. But of course, the problem with this is that the pyramid didn't even exist until the 1990s long after World War II, and yet here it is, having survived until the Great War of 2077. Another example is in downtown Boston. If you head to the Boston Harbor, just north of the Custom House Tower, we find a park inhabited by a bunch of Radstag. It's a great place to go to reliably find Radstag. It's easily identifiable because it has these unique arches lining the sidewalks with a bunch of vines growing on them. This is called Christopher Columbus Park. Park, and it corresponds to the real-world Christopher Columbus Park, which, like the one in the Fallout universe, is in roughly the same location and has these big, beautiful ivy arches over the sidewalks. The problem is that Christopher Columbus Park was created in 1974, but it didn't look like the park we see today until 1999 when it was renovated. Once the renovations were complete, it was open to the public in 2003, and yet we find this same park in the Fallout universe, looking none the worse for wear long after the apocalypse of 2077. There are dozens of other architectural post-divergence issues like these in all of the games. I could spend an hour talking about them. But in addition to architecture, music is another big problem for the Divergence. In Fallout's 3, New Vegas, and 4, they use real-world music that we can listen to from Galaxy News Radio, Diamond City Radio, Radio New Vegas, and so on. The problem with using real music is that this music was made by real artists and published by real publishers on dates that we can look up. It's not a problem if we make sure that every single song was published before World War II, 
But that's not the case. Many of our favorite songs were indeed published in the 20s, 30s, and early 40s, but over half of them were published in the 50s or even in the 60s. There are a few notable ones that go even beyond that. In Fallout New Vegas, we hear Ain't That a Kick in the Head, a song by Jimmy Van Housen and Sammy Kahn, but a recording by Dean Martin from 1960. Like the fella once said, ain't that a kick in the head? Almost 15 years after the end of World War II. Then there's Big Iron by Marty Robbins, which was released in 1959. Big Iron on his head. Blue Moon by Richard Rogers and Lawrence Hart, but sung by Frank Sinatra, and his recording was recorded in 1961. Obsidian isn't the only one. In Fallout 4, we hear the song Crawl Out Through the Fallout by Sheldon Allman, and this was released in 1960. Crawl out through the fallout, baby, when they drop that bomb. Then, The End of the World by Skeeter Davis, released in 1962. It's the end of the world. And famously, The Wanderer. This song was prominently used in the marketing materials for Fallout 4. It was written by Ernie Marseca, produced by Gene Schwartz, but the recording is by Dion DiMucci, which was released in 1961. The strange quirks of the divergence when it comes to music is prominently on display in the trailer for Fallout 76. In that trailer, we listen to a unique recording of Take Me Home Country Roads. We don't know who is performing the cover, but we do know that the song was written by Bill Danoff, Taffy Nivert, and John Denver in 1971. West Virginia, Mama. Decades after World War II. But this isn't even the most prominent example. The most prominent example I could find is from Obsidian's Fallout New Vegas. On Radio New Vegas, we hear a song called Heartaches by the Number. It was written by Harlan Howard, produced by KTEL Records, and performed by Guy Mitchell. Now, Guy Mitchell produced versions of this song as early as 1959, but the specific recording we hear on the radio in Fallout New Vegas is a recording that was made in 1980. A beautiful song, and it fits the setting of Fallout New Vegas expertly, but this recording was made one year before I was born. <laughs> Posing a problem for a fixed date, divergence. Finally, there are some potentially divergence-breaking issues with what I'll call gun lore in the game. And many of the most notable issues come from Fallout New Vegas. For example, in New Vegas, we find a grenade launcher, which is a wonderful little weapon. This is what it looks like in the game. The divergence problem is that it's clearly been modeled after this weapon, the China Lake Pump Action Grenade Launcher. You can see the clear resemblance. These weapons didn't see service in the US military until 1968. They were used in the Vietnam War, but the Vietnam War is a gray period of Fallout history. There's not much on it. We know there was a Vietnam War in the Fallout universe, Universe, but only because of this one line we hear at the very beginning of Fallout Tactics. These forces met their mark. We have declared war in Vietnam. But we don't plan to In this one line, the United States declares war on Vietnam, but that actually never happened in the real universe. In the real world, we never officially declared war on Vietnam. Instead, it was seen as a, quote, extended military engagement. So the grenade launcher could have been developed for the Fallout version of the Vietnam War, whatever that version was, but it seems coincidental that it would have been developed alongside the one developed in our own universe as well. Another is the grenade rifle. You recall that I had a lot of fun with this weapon. Well, a unique version of this weapon called Thump Thump in my series on the Legion. This beautiful weapon is based on a real world grenade rifle called the M79. You can see that they look almost identical. In the real world, it was designed between 1953 and 1960, but it wasn't actually produced and used by the military until 1961 long after World War II. Then there's the silenced 
22 SMG, a beautiful little weapon. We can get this from Vendertron in the Gunrunner's stand, but this weapon is based on the real world American 180. You can see that again, they look almost identical. This weapon again, wasn't developed until the 1960s. Now, some machine guns, of course, had been used long before. There were even some flat pan versions similar to this one that was used during World War II. But the silenced 22 SMG most closely resembles the American 180. The only major difference is, is that the American 180 has a stock, whereas the silenced SMG just has a pistol grip. But the biggest potentially divergence-breaking gun lore issue from Fallout New Vegas is the existence of Picatinny rails on many of the weapons. A Picatinny rail is used on weapons in place of iron sights as a platform upon which to mount accessories, like scopes and heavy sights. It's a great little device that helps make a gun more modular, allowing the owner to customize the sights. The lore problem is that the Picatinny rails weren't developed until the 1980s. However, that's just when they were first being toyed with. Military standards for the Picatinny rails weren't solidified until February of 1995. It was only then that we began to see them on M16s and M4s. However, in Fallen New Vegas, we find them on the Marksman Carbine. The Marksman Carbine is modeled after an M4, and here you can see in this example, the scope is attached to a Picatinny rail. So, we see that there are divergence issues all over the place, from guns to architecture, songs to technology. There are dozens of recorded events that happened long before World War II, and there are dozens of things that we find in the universe that weren't invented in hours until long after World War II. I believe that all of this evidence tells us that the divergence can't be a single date sometime after World War II. Instead, I think the divergence must be a slow-moving event. It started in the 1500s really slowly, started to pick up steam a bit in the 1800s and early 1900s. Then after World War II, the divergence was in full swing and a whole lot of things were changing culminating in the Great War of 2077. I think that the Great War is really the definitive event of the Divergence. It hasn't happened in our own world yet, <laughs> and hopefully never will, and it was such a dramatic event that it completely changed the Fallout universe as it was, turning it into the wasteland that it is. Now, there are many more potentially divergence-breaking events in the Bethesda and Obsidian games that I simply didn't have time to include here. This isn't a comprehensive video. So let me ask you, which are your favorite potentially divergence-breaking events? Which are the ones that are the most troublesome for you? Do you agree with me that if all of this evidence must be true and canonical, that the divergence can't be a fixed point in time and must instead be a rolling event, slowly moving across the centuries and decades? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I publish many new videos each week here on my channel, so if you want to make sure you don't miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. Let me apologize for the reverb that you've been hearing in this video. I just moved into a new house. I haven't had a chance to outfit my studio with sound dampeners or anything like that, and it's probably going to be a while before I can. So I beg for your patience while I get used to my new recording environment. Never fear, I'll be sure to get things situated eventually. I take Sundays off, so I'm not going to have a video for you Monday, but never fear, I'll be back to work on Monday, and I'll have a new video for you Tuesday morning. I've got a brand new shirt in the shop, folks. Cheer, cheer, cheeriest. This beautiful portrait comes in a variety of both men's and women's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. It also comes on a bunch of other products, smartphone cases, pillows, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon this coming week with more videos.